Um, we don't have as many people today. I wonder if it's because I forgot to post an announcement. That's on me. Um, like last time, uh, I need somebody to tear some pages out of their notebook. Anyone care to volunteer? Two pages for me. Thank you. Thank you. Just 8.30 and 9.30 as usual. Um, this time it's just because I forgot my backpack, so that's my bad. Um, today we're going to talk about the rest of chapter 11. I think there's like some very last chapter 11 stuff to go over on Friday still, but we're talking about the rest of chapter 11 today. Um, just signaling, right? Um, more than anything, I'm going to focus on how to understand signaling from Dr. Pogorski's perspective and, and, and his way of explaining things. So you'll notice a lot of wordy slides. It's because I take them word for word from his slides, and then we, we go through them and break them down, right? Because I, I found that that helps. If you guys feel like it's too much of an issue, um, I can stop doing it. But in the past, people have told me that it, it helps them to break down Dr. Pogorski's slides and actually understand what he's saying. Anyway, um, before we get started, any questions about anything? Mastering Bio, Dr. Pogorski, the material we've covered? No? All right, we're going to dive into it then. Um, can't, can't pass up on my jokes, though. The day mitochondria went from being the powerhouse of the cell to the ATP synthesis by oxidative phosphorylation was a horrible day. And that was probably for most of you in this class. Um, I know we're not talking about mitochondria anymore, but my wife found this the other day, and I thought it was pretty funny. Um, then I found this comic. He says, I'd like to return this. It's unused. She says, this is your diploma. He says, cash is fine. Um, so these are all a little harsher, but I think they're funny. Most of you will get use, hopefully all of you will get use out of your diploma. Um, if you'd like to return it, uh, you can't, so that sucks. All right, um, our biology fact for the day, an individual blood cell, one blood cell, takes about 60 seconds, just one minute, to go around your entire body, right? We've got millions of these, so they're all doing it in unison, but yeah, if you had a blood cell start like in your big toe, it could get up to like the top of your head and all the way back down in about a minute, which I think is actually pretty impressive considering all the routes that it has to take. And when we study the heart, um, you'll see like there's actually, there's a lot going on there. Um, study tip is to relieve stress, right? And everybody knows this, but I think sometimes we forget that that's an important part of learning is taking a break from the learning and just going for a walk, taking a nap, making a good lunch, playing a video game, watching a movie, you know, whatever, whatever you do to relax, you know, you can't study nonstop, right? You, you will do worse if you study nonstop, right? You, you, your brain can't handle it, your body can't handle it. So space it out, find ways to just, to just chill, right? And that's actually easier said than done when you got a test in two days. So maybe start doing it like more than two days before a test, right? Space out your studying. All right, so what's going on in these pictures? Not a rhetorical question. What happens is that the G protein receptor is inactive when it doesn't receive the signaling molecule. But once it receives the signaling mo molecule, this causes the have received GTP, replacing it, which then sends it to the inactive enzyme, uh, and it's just the cycle of causing it to go to the inactive enzyme, activating it, which the enzyme then releases a response or a signal off of it, and then becomes inactive again. Yeah. So you, you got all four panels in there in, in one go. That was actually pretty impressive. I'm not going to lie to you. I couldn't have done that. So. Thank you. You can go home now. Um, that, that, yeah, that's the whole thing. Let's talk about just picture one. What are we looking at in just picture one? Break it into steps, I guess. 
So step one, what's happening? Yeah, nothing, nothing's happening, right? There we got our, we got our receptor, a G protein, and an enzyme, all right there by the plasma membrane. None of them are doing anything, right? Um, why not? Yeah, it's like the switch is turned off, okay? The lights aren't on because the switch isn't up. Fairly simple, but sometimes we kind of take that for granted, okay? So signaling is only off if there's not a ligand there. If there is a ligand there, it's on. It's, it's kind of all or nothing, right? There's not like a weak signal, strong signal. It just, it, it's on or off. So in picture one, it's off. What's going on in picture two then? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, where's my pen? This ligand has attached to our what? What's that? It's a protein, okay? It's a, it's a receptor protein. The, uh, the ligand has bound to it. This uh, G protein has come in with its GTP, okay, and you know when it when it runs off, it turns into GDP. This is, it's for our purposes the same thing as ATP and ADP, right? I think it's just guanine instead of adenosine. Not sure. Um, could could be anything. Not a big deal. It comes in, attaches to the protein. See how they both have like a yellow glow, like like old school renaissance Christian paintings, like to have a halo. You know what I'm talking about. Um, that's just to show that they're active, right? This enzyme is still inactive, though. Why? It's not glowing. <laughs> why, why isn't it glowing? The power of Christ has not yet compelled it, or? Huh? I heard it. No GTP, right? So no, nothing has interacted with it in any way. So what's happening in picture three, then? It changes shape, that's important. Why? Why did it change shape? Yeah. So this, this G protein has moved over from the receptor to the enzyme. It's carrying GTP, it's carrying energy. It attaches to the enzyme and gives that energy over to it, right? And then that's when the key part comes in and it changes shape. Question? Yeah. In this process, is it possible for the G protein to go from the activated receptor to the inactive enzyme, or is this showing one or the other? Does only one or the other take place, or can that same G protein activate both the receptor and the enzyme within like the same, not exactly the same time, but within, but within like one set of reactions? Yeah, that's actually what we're looking at here. So it's this, this, this is our inactive state in step one. Then the protein comes over and attaches to the receptor and gets activated. Then it goes from here to here. So that, that's what step three is showing, is it's gone from the receptor over to the enzyme. So that, that is actually what it's doing is all, it's all one piece. It gets activated by the receptor and then it activates the enzyme. Does that make sense? Kind of like a messenger. Yeah, it's, it's blind luck most of the time. It's just bouncing around because it doesn't have eyes or a brain. It doesn't have cilia. It doesn't have any, it hasn't, it's just a protein and it just bounces around until boom, it attaches to the enzyme, right? Then when it attaches to the enzyme, what happens? It gets energy making it change shape. Why do, why, why do I care so much about it changing shape? I just want to pick, be nitpicky here. If it didn't change shape, there's no way it would have been able to attach or be able to keep the reaction going. So it has to change shape so that they can be attached to the point. Yes, because shape determines function. It, it comes up so many times in biology, right? So the shape change that the enzyme undergoes, what does that do? It's up here. 
the enzyme changes shape and we get a cellular response, right? So it seems like a long process. This happens all the time, nonstop, right? So these, these, these happen really fast. We've just broken it down into individual steps. They, they're running back and forth. I think it's millions of times a second. It might be less, but it's still at least thousands of times a second, right? These, these happen nonstop. So the enzyme changes shape. We get a cellular response. What's image four? It's turned off. So what's the difference between image one and image four? Pretty much just that phosphate coming off. Other than that, it's the exact same, right? So why even put it in there? How, is it that important that the phosphate came off? Not really. Why, why is it in there? Is it in there because it's what causes the GDP to switch to GTP? Not so much. It's, it's what's making it, well, yeah, it's going from GTP to GDP when it loses the phosphate. But why do we, why do we care? Why couldn't we just stop at the cellular response? That's all we want. Like, doesn't that shut off your response? Yes. Why do we care? Yeah, you don't want a non-stop response from these things. You have to be able to turn it off, right? It's like a, like a blender, right? You want to turn the blender on, and you want to make a smoothie, but once it's a smoothie, you got to turn it off. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to put the smoothie in a cup. It's just going to go everywhere, right? So if, let's say the cellular response is um, to activate some lysosomes to digest some dead cells. Well, if we can't turn them back off, they're going to digest everything, and they're going to kill the cell, and it's going to go rampant, right? So we have to be able to turn stuff off. I know that seems nitpicky for me to spend that much time talking about just image four when it's nothing, but Dr. Pogorski likes to have the whole picture, and he likes you to understand you have to be able to turn it on, but he also wants you to know how you turn it off, okay? Uh, make a note of that, memorize that, whatever. Learn both ends of every procedure and everything. Dr. Pogorski is a huge fan of start to finish. Not just start and yeah, we got where we wanted and we're good. It's, it, everything has to be able to turn off too. So learn how stuff activates, but learn how it deactivates. Did I see a hand for a question? I was just gonna ask, what is this whole process called? Cell signaling. Okay. This, this, this probably has a specific one, but we're just using it as an example of cell signaling. That sounds right. I'll take your word for it. No, you're right. Um, it's, uh, he took notes on it. No, yeah. Um, so the, yeah, this specific one is G-protein linked. Um, here we're just kind of looking at the, how it works, but that specific one is. So why does it go from three to four? Yeah. Is that, that, that phosphate comes off? Uh, it, it runs out of energy. Because the phosphate comes off, so when it goes from GTP to GDP, it no longer has enough. Third, huh? third, third, third. Why does it go over to the activated enzyme? Why does it come off? Oh, same thing. It just it it. We only want the signal to last so long, so it attaches. It sends its signal and it leaves. I don't know if God decides that, or like, I don't know who's in charge of that. But by nature, they they attach, they they do their job, and they leave. I, I don't know the physics behind it. You don't really need to. Sorry, I was not understanding what you were saying at all. It just it pops on and leaves. Okay, yeah. Everybody else knew what you were asking. Um, yeah, pops on, signals, leaves. Always. Um, not, not really because there's not enough and it's an inorganic phosphate. So it's just, it's just going to stick back on. Um, if they didn't stick back on, I guess it would create a gradient, but there's not really like a, as far as I'm aware, there's not like a phosphate pump to get rid of them anyway, but yeah, no, they just, they pop off and stick back on and just like that. 
They sign another hand. So is the same protein that kicks the phosphate off the same one? Because, it, I mean, it looks like it is. I just wanted to clarify. Like, it's the same DTPase that, like, receives the DTP, like the G-protein, and reacts with that to cause the reaction, and it's the same one that takes the phosphate off, right, to stop the reaction. I think what you're asking is how do we put the how do we put it on and how do we take it off? Right, like is it just the same enzyme? Like we don't have to remember this like in the This enzyme in the in the right corner here? Yeah. That yeah, that's the same enzyme the whole time. The only thing that changes is its shape. But in in, in, in these four panels it's we just have the G coupled receptor, the G protein, and the enzyme, and they're the same three in every step. The enzyme just changes shape, and the G protein either has GDP or GTP. But they're all the same thing, yeah. Is there another hand? I thought I saw another hand. So on the second panel, when the G protein moves over to the receptor, is the GDP just dropped off, or is it transformed into GTP? I'm not sure I understand the question. So, if, so it had the GDP, right? And then it moves over to the receptor. Yeah. Is that then turned into GTP, or was the receptor giving it GTP? Is just like a whole separate thing? No, still no. <laughs> Not to. Maybe I'm just missing. Does somebody else understand? Where's the GTP coming from? Is that what you're going for? So we've got our GDP, right? I don't know where the phosphate comes from per so se it's just system. see how this one gets kicked off yeah. it kind of hangs out down here so there's just there's some phosphates hanging out down here and it sees an opportunity and, and jumps on okay, cool. I know that's like a super inaccurate way of describing that it's because that's, that's okay. about as much as you need to know it just okay. comes and it pops on and then it pops off and they just, it just keeps going. Okay. do it like that I don't know if it's before or after. Um, close enough that it doesn't really matter. Just know that while it's attached to the receptor and attached to the enzyme, it's GTP, so it, it's activated, it has energy. And that, so no, in two, panels two and three, it has GTP. Panels one and four, it has GDP. And that's what makes the difference between activated and inactivated. I don't know when exactly it starts, but it's in so those two. So it was like GDP, like completely like getting removed. Is it, is that the case, or does it just add the phosphate? That I don't know whether it like leaves and comes back, or if just a phosphate leaves and comes back. I, I don't think we need to know to that level. All right, other questions? After the GDP hits the, um, the enzyme and the phosphate falls off, and does it, ret it returns back to GDP, does that G protein go back to the, the receptor? So you're talking about after it gets here? Yes. Yeah, eventually we just go back to step one. Okay. So it, it's kind of a cycle. It goes one, two, three, four, and then eventually back to one. And does all this take place in the mitochondria? Or where? This is just inside cells. Just inside so. Cells. Yeah, this is the plasma membrane of your cell. This is like the extracellular area outside your cell, and this is your cytoplasm of your cell, right? So this is just how, I don't, I don't know if it's in a specific cell for this specific function, but it's inside cells. All right, we spent an exorbitant amount of time on those four pictures, which is fine. I'd rather you understood it than me just go, eh, I'm done. But I am now, so we're going to keep going. Different process, okay. Um, what's going on here? Yes. Well, what, what, yes. That's, that's the name of the process. What's happening? You're letting ions come into the cell through, like, facilitated diffusion. Yes. What's facilitated diffusion? Energy is just flows in because there's high concentration and it just comes 
Yes, but the facilitated part is this guy and this guy. So normal diffusion, it would just go across on its own. Facilitated infusion, still no energy, but because we attach that ligand up in uh, panel one, it sends a signal to the protein to make it do what? Open up, Open up change shape, right? It, it changes shape, shape determines function. Now its function is to let ions through, okay? They diffuse, but it's facilitated because a protein had to open up. Does that make sense? So non-facilitated diffusion, they just, they just go because they want to. Facilitated diffusion, no ATP, but somebody still has to open the channel, okay? And then what's happening in panel three? Ligand left, channel closes, okay? Again, I'm not trying to just be nitpicky. He cares that you know how this process starts, how this process stops. It's not super complicated, but in a test, if you've only studied how it starts, you can kind of psych yourself out and not be sure if it stops the exact same way or did, was there like a different ligand that had to come and turn it off? Did it have to change charge? Okay. So just know the ligand ha attaches, the protein opens. When it's done, the ligand leaves and it closes back up. Fairly simple, but, but know how stuff starts and stops. I'm going to say it like a hundred times and someone still won't do it. Know how stuff starts and stops. They, they do whatever they're meant to do. It's going to depend on the ion. It's going to depend on the cell. But you're going to get some kind of response. Um, this, this obviously isn't a neuron. But for example, in a neuron, if you get sodium coming in, you're going to get an action potential. And, and you're going to get some kind of motion. And then if you get soda, or, sorry, potassium coming in, then you're going to stop it. So that's an example of ions enter and start a reaction. And then different ions enter and stop a reaction. So, it just depends on the cell and the ion, but they just per perform some kind of response. Does that make sense? Yeah. So could this happen in the reverse too? How in the reverse? So could it attach to the inside and send stuff out? Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't see why not. Or yeah. Like even like attached to the top the could it attach to the top? Yeah, because it's just by gradient. Okay. So if you opened it and dumped in a ton and then closed it, and then came back and opened it like right after, by diffusion, it probably would all come right back out. And I'm sure there's plenty of times that that's necessary that we need to take the ions back out because we're done. So yeah, that would be a good way of, of reversing the process. I don't know if there's, I don't think there's one where it attaches inside because that ligand um, can't pass through the membrane. So it wouldn't be able to like get inside and open it that way. Um, that I don't know for sure. Might have to Google that one. Probably won't be on the test. So it's not super important to understand why the ligand attaches, right? It's just to know that. Because it's done. Happens. Yeah. I don't know the chemistry or physics behind it. I don't know who's the overlord that decides. You know, it just is done, so it leaves. I'm sure in a, in a much more advanced class we would learn exactly how it works, but I don't know. Other questions? All right. Cool. Okay. You guys reckon? Oh. Sorry. Um, I, mean, I don't know. Are you going to go over the uh, receptor uh, tyrosine kinase? Not really, because it's, 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 it's kind of the same idea. The ligand cool. attaches, and a reaction occurs, and the ligand leaves, and the reaction stops. So that's the one where like, the, the reaction causes the uh, receptors to become an enzyme. Yeah, they become that dimer. They attach to each other. Right, is that important? You're just in passing right quick? I guess. It kind of, it, they're not any more complicated than this, so I just kind of picked a few and went over them. It's all essentially the same idea. Okay. If you're still super confused on it, if, even if you don't know what we're talking about, if you're going through and studying it and you're like, I don't get what's going on, you can email me or you can watch the Penoptos or, or do whatever. I don't know. I, I didn't want to go through all of them. I'm lazy. Um, other questions? All right. You guys recognize this from class and from my last SI when you were all like, wait, what's the transduction? We haven't talked about that. I forgot that we hadn't talked about it. We have now. So 
What's step one? Don't say reception. I mean, what's happening in step one? Ligand attaches to protein. Okay, that's it. Step one is just ligand attaches to protein. What happens between step one and step two? Yes, how? How, how is the information passed on? Protein changes shape. Okay, I keep bringing it up because it, it, it happens every time and it's very important. The protein changes shape. That shape change does what? Say it louder. Starts the reaction, which is called transduction. Right there, okay? So the protein changes shape, that starts the transduction, okay? A lot of times you call it a cascade, right? So what's happening though? What is transduction? Yes, we're passing on the signal. So is, 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 is this signal molecule and this thing the same thing? No. He never enters the cell. Okay, that signal molecule, it's not a he, it's not a she. I shouldn't have done that. Um, it never enters the cell, right? Just stays outside, does its own thing. Um, so what's, what is that one that I circled? written on the slide. It's a relay molecule. Um, wow. Nobel Prize. Um, what does it do? It relays messages. How? I've said it a hundred times. It changes shape. It changes shape. So it goes from the orb to the beanbag chair to the football, right? Um, what did I call it last time? It was like a 80s chair, beanbag chair, 80s chair, they're the same thing. And they're still valid today. Um, so what does that shape change do? Passes on the information, causes a reaction, right? I, I know I keep saying it over and over, it's because I, I want to say it over and over just for kicks. No, you have to know it, right? You have to understand the shape change passes on the signal. Okay, so ligand attaches to receptor, receptor changes shape, shape change in receptor changes relay molecule shape to, to shape one, to shape two, to shape three, right? Question? So that's the same molecule? One, two, and three? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Just changing shape. The, the numbers don't mean it's a different molecule, it's a different shape. Same molecule. So that single molecule is getting changed from orb to beanbag chair to football. Still one molecule. Not in, not in every process, I'm always careful with that. There's, there's probably some processes out there where one hits two, hits three, hits four, and moves like that. But most of them, it's just, it changes shape and goes along. It's, it's both. So, but that's a different cascade. It's the same but different, yeah. That's, this is why it's tricky. So it depends on the cascade. This is just a generic, so we'll, we'll look at more specific examples in a second. But one gets changed into two, gets changed into three, right? They're the same molecule as, as far as this picture goes, but not in, every, not in every case, right? So sometimes it's one, and then it, then it turns something else into two, then it turns something else into three, right? The, the picture will usually be more specific. Like I said, this is kind of just a generic overview. We'll look at specific examples, and it's usually fairly clear that you're changing molecules, because you can see like this molecule comes in, process, another molecule comes in. But you'll see what I'm saying in a second. It's, it's usually more clear than this. Question. No, it, yeah, it eventually pops off. Just like all the other ones, it comes, it, it delivers its signal, and when it's done, it leaves. Otherwise, you'd have a nonstop signal 
and again, you'd have a problem. So that's smart, though. They, these end the exact same way as the rest of them. Okay? Always know how it starts, always know how it stops. It stops by the ligand leaving, just, just coming back off. Right? Uh, actually, on that, so say, you know, with the receptor signaling, and it goes to molecule one, as soon as molecule one is starting, you know, the cascading and so forth, will the ligand, does the ligand come off at the end of the activation, or as soon as it starts going, can the ligand leave and the process continues even if, the, I mean, is that really relevant? Not super relevant just because we don't get tested at that level. If I had to guess, I would say it pops off right after it delivers its signal because there's no need for it to keep saying. signaling, okay. but not, not something we get into. Just if I had to guess, I would say it would attach, deliver, and leave. Other questions? It, when we when it show if you see a picture of it because again this is just the generic from the textbook picture when you see an because this isn't like a process like I can't say this happens in this cell to get this reaction this is just the generic when you see the actual process for an actual reaction it's a lot more clear and we'll see those in a second I, I have a few slides on it other questions you guys are just waiting for the specific um, reaction, right? So see how we're actually able to see like different separate molecules here. And these are each different kinases, right? You, you can see more clearly in the picture the, the chain going on. So that last picture is just generic. This is, this is an actual protein phosphorylation cascade. Again, I don't know what exactly, which process this is. I don't know what cell it occurs in, what, what reaction it creates. But this is a protein phosphorylation cascade. All right, so a lot of words on this slide, right? Why would I do that? Because Dr. Pogorski puts a lot of words on his slide, and he reads them like a guy who has a PhD in genetics. And he just goes right through it, and you're like, what? Those aren't words. Those, that's not, you know? So we're going to break it down, OK? The reversible addition and removal of phosphates from proteins is a major way of regulating cellular processes. What does that mean? So phosphates get kind of removed to proteins um, that facilitate different processes. Yeah. So if we add phosphorylation or remove dephosphorylation. So if we add or remove a phosphate from a protein, we can activate or deactivate a cellular process, right? So again, the lysosomes, right? We want to turn some lysosomes on and get rid of uh, a dead piece of the Golgi, right? But we don't want to do that forever. So we add a phosphate. We turn it from in this case, AT, or ADP to ATP. Right now it's active, it's got energy, it turns on the lysosomes, they digest the Golgi. Then the cell goes, all right, that's enough. It takes the phosphates back off, and it's like turning the light switch off. Everything stops, right? So the key vocab words are phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. So what does phosphorylation mean? Add a phosphate. What does that do? Activates a protein, right? Because if you add a phosphate to that, what do you get? All right? You get ATP. ATP is energy. When you have energy, you can run a reaction, right? Well, how would you stop that? Take a phosphate off, and you get. ADP, and you can start back over. What is, what is this process called? Dephosphorylation. For once, something in biology actually makes sense by its name. Usually it is photosystem 2 and then photosystem 1, and they have them backwards. And at least this one's OK, right? So 
Adding and removing phosphates reversibly changes protein shape, toggling protein activity on and off. What does that mean? Basically, uh, the phosphate, uh, when the phosphate chef attaches to the protein, the shape changes. And it goes through a direct, uh, you know, reverse. Once the phosphate drops off, you go back to the original shape that was in. Perfect. We add a phosphate. Protein shape changes. It's active. It runs a process. We take off a phosphate. Protein changes back to its original shape. Right? It's not a permanent shape change. Okay. So it can go from orb to beanbag chair to football right back back to, I don't know if it has to go back to beanbag chair and then orb or if it can go right back to orb, not a big deal. But it can go back, right? It doesn't, it's not permanently misshapen or anything. They change shape and they change back, change shape, change back, right? It's just whether or not we attach a phosphate to it. Does that make sense? This is, what, what's the purpose of all of this? Turn it on and off. That's perfect. Why do we want to turn it on? Got to get a cellular response, right? Why do we want to turn it off? Because we don't want non-stop cellular responses, right? Cancer, that's one of the ways that cancer works is non-stop cellular responses, right? That's how tumors grow is because there's something wrong with the cells that nobody says, hey, time to stop growing, right? They, they have a problem stopping their cellular responses, whether it's, whether it's specifically interrupting these phosphorylation cascades or, or whatever. There's lots of ways cancer can, can work, but it's bad to have set nonstop cellular responses, right? So uh, this might have already been covered, but once you know, the active protein is obviously activated, these inactive proteins, are they attracted to it, or is it just through the floating of the cytoplasm when they just bump into each other? As far as I'm aware, it's just a kind of a blind bumping into each other type of thing, which sounds really inefficient. But if you know that there's like thousands of these in a cell, they're going to bump into each other all the time. And they just, because it's just turning on or off, like it's not super specific, if it bumps into, if it's turned off and it bumps into one that's turned off, nothing happens. If it's turned on and it bumps into one that's turned on, nothing happens. So you can't like get it wrong, if that makes sense. But yeah, as far as I'm aware, it's just random bumping into each other. I don't think so, but I don't know. I do not remember. But if everyone in this room emailed him and asked him to make a practice test, he would. For real. Like, if one person goes, are you going to make a practice test? And he goes, eh, I don't know. And that's the only person he hears from, he's going to go, eh, no big deal. If all of you email him, then he might. <laughs> or, or even better idea, ask him in class in front of like 400 people and then everyone will be like yes you got to do it so it's your job on Friday no um, somebody ask on Friday if I ask he'll say no um, yeah somebody ask on Friday and depending on his mood and whether or not he's feeling generous he'll probably say yes in front of the whole class but I don't know The, as actually probably the next slide. Yes. yes. Good question. Do we have any questions before I move on to that? I don't want to just skip on. You guys are eager to know what these are? Okay. So kinases add phosphates. Phosphatases take them off. They're both enzymes, right? They just have that different function of addition or removal. Okay. So I have a fun little phrase. Um, because I know you guys like fun little phrases like your kindergartners. Kinases are kind and give phosphates freely. Phosphatases like to phosphatake them back, right? It's dumb and it makes you feel like you're 12, but guess what? When you're on the test, you'll go, kinases are kind and phosphatases take, phosphatake. And you'll remember it, I promise. And if that doesn't make sense to you, make up your own. But come up with some way, because because nobody just goes, kinase, that clearly means addition of phosphates. Like, what does that even mean? And phosphatase, well, it sounds like phosphate, so it probably gives phosphates, right? No, it takes them. 
Okay, so don't get mixed up. Don't think, oh, phosphatase adds and kinase doesn't have the word phosphate in it, so it must take them off. Kinases are kind, phosphatase is phosphatase. Does that answer your question as far as what they are? That's, that's basically the level we need to know it to. So um, let's see here. Here's our protein kinase, right? What's he doing? It looks like he's taking a phosphate, doesn't it? Because ATP became ADP, so there's a problem. It just took an ATP, or it took a phosphate. We're not talking about right here, okay? It comes down the chain, and it gives the phosphate. So when we're talking about give and take, we're not talking about giving and taking from the ATP or to the ADP or anything like that. We're talking about whether it gives to the protein or it takes from the protein. Does that make sense? Ignore, not, not, don't ignore that because that's where the phosphate came from. But so the kinase gets its phosphate from ATP, gives its phosphate to the protein. So this is our phosphatase, and he's phosphataking it away, right? Does that make sense to everyone? I know that that trips people up. They go, it just, it just took the phosphate from the ATP. When we're talking about kinase and phosphatase, we're talking about its interaction with the protein, not with the ATP. So when, uh, when the inactive protein bumps the active protein kinase, is that's where the phosphate is like, given to it, right? Or am I reading this yeah, right? so this is our inactive protein. This is an active protein kinase because it picked up that phosphate. The inactive protein comes by, and right here, it gets the phosphate. It looks like it's much later, um, but it's, it's as they make contact. They just didn't want to put it right here because then it'd be in the way. But yeah, active protein makes contact. That's when it gets the phosphate. If they're bumping, then why do you need the ATP? Because I mean, would, would the bump be enough of the reaction to get or the phosphate over, or is the ATP what gets the phosphate? So I've made a mess. Let's. The ATP gets, well, What's the best way to phrase this? The ATP gives a phosphate to the active protein kinase, and then the active protein kinase gives it to the active protein. Yeah. Seems like too many steps. It's just that the active protein doesn't have the ability to pick up a phosphate. So the active protein kinase is the middleman. It also doesn't have the ability to get rid of it, so the phosphatase is the middleman. Does that make sense? Everybody understanding? So, it's like a relay molecule that has like these things that keep on. It's one of these uh, things that you say, say that one more time. So, uh, with relay molecules, they use HP and ADP. Is that what you mean? Um, I think it was just this. Where were we? This specific one is GDP because it's a G protein linked receptor, so it works with GDP instead of ATP. I think there's, there's ATP, there's GTP, I think there's like CTP, there's all kinds of triphosphates and diphosphates. This specific reaction uses GTP, because it's a G protein. This specific reaction, and it's not even really a specific reaction, most of them just use ATP as the default. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, it's like a baton pass. So um, this inactive protein kinase gets activated, and then it passes that on to here, and that passes it on to there, and that passes it on to there, and that starts a signal. Yeah. So it's a lot like a baton pass, like a relay race type thing. Um, I don't know what else you could compare that to. You could compare it to protein phosphorylation cascades. Um, anybody else think of a, like a good comparison? You just want to stare at me. 
Okay. All right. So I'll just awkwardly move on. <laughs> Any questions? You guys are the worst. <laughs> no? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I feel like an idiot up here sometimes. But that's probably because I am. So just standard. All right. What are second messengers? They aren't proteins necessarily? Is that what you said? Okay. Okay. What do they do? Relay messages, right? Because they're messengers. So it's a small water soluble molecule or ion that transduces a signal within a cell. So it's just a small molecule or ion that passes on a signal inside a cell, okay? Always inside a cell. Second messengers are only in our cells, okay? Um, second messengers readily diffuse and broadcast signals widely within the cell. That's an important part. They're like a satellite dish, right? They, they take a single signal and they spread it all over, okay? So it's, uh, how could you say this in like a real world example? Anybody think of a real world example besides a satellite that gets a signal and spreads it all over? It's Paul Revere, right? Somebody tells him the British are coming, and then he rides down with a bell and he yells, the British are coming, the British are coming. So everybody knows, right? So Paul Revere is the second messenger. He's the one that tells everybody. Uh, what else? So could the second messenger like, start multiple cascade of like, reactions? Yes. And we'll see some examples of that in a second, but yeah, it'll it'll set off tons of stuff. Could be like that one gossip person. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Um, I love gossip. I do. Um, yeah, so the one one person hears that so and so broke up with so and so, and then they tell fifteen or twenty people, right? And then they each tell fifteen or twenty people, and they tell fifteen or twenty people. The next thing you know, their whole prom night's ruined, right? Um, Good example, good example. Everybody likes gossip, though, so it's not just me. So that's the AMP, the protein Um, you're talking about right here? Yeah, so it gets, um, how am I going here? So this is the same process as that first set of panels we were looking at, and it activates the enzyme. The enzyme activates the cyclic AMP, and then the cyclic AMP activates the protein kinase, but it activates like a lot of them, if that makes sense. Cyclic AMP just stands, or CAMP stands for cyclic adenosine monophosphate, right? So it's not ATP, it's not ADP, it's a M P, but it's cyclic because it, it cycles back and forth. That's where C A M P comes from. Um, so memorize these: cyclic A M P, cyclic G M P, calcium, phosphorylated sugar, or I P three. Okay, those are the important second messengers. So he could absolutely just ask you, what role does phosphorylated sugar play in signaling? And you would have to know phosphorylated sugar is a second messenger, and it broadcasts and widens cell signals. All he, could, he could just say, what, is, what does IP3 do in cell signaling? And you would have to know. What does CA2 plus do in cell signaling? What does cyclic GMP do in cell signaling? So memorize those four. CAMP, G, G, CGMP. CA++ or CA2+, IP3. I'm going back to like my high school biology. I remember them saying that like it's pretty much useless to make like monophosphate, like AMP, because it doesn't actually have, it wouldn't be useful. It wouldn't be useful in like, in the sense of it doesn't have energy. So you couldn't survive off of AMP. Because that would be the easiest thing, because it's just one phosphate. So you just stick one phosphate on and go. It's just, it doesn't have enough energy to keep you alive. But in this specific case, it is useful 
for signaling. Does that make sense? The cyclic AMP? Yeah, so like, do they like just take? I don't know. I don't know if it's like a really broken down ATP. I don't know if it gets made somewhere else. Does anybody know where cyclic AMP comes from? Um, Dr. Schwartz here today said that when it hits that side plate, so the, I don't know how to pronounce that, yeah. it drops to the bottom. Ah, okay. So this ATP is giving two phosphates away and becoming AMP. Perfect. Mm -hmm. ATP and ADP have kind of a linear structure like this, so lots of stuff can stick to them and lots of stuff can come off of them. Uh, cyclic AMP, that's a terrible ring. Um, you get what I'm saying. It doesn't let stuff in or let stuff out as easily. You don't need to know like all the fine details of it. Just know what ATP is and what it does, what ADP is and what it doesn't do, and then what CAMP and GCMP and all those are. Does that make sense? Just know what they are and what they do. That's about it. Other questions? Everybody's getting antsy to leave. It's because we went over time. Um, because did we not cover citric acid cycle on test one? It wasn't on there. Um, probably about a quarter of it, if I were, will be like citric acid cycle, photosynthesis, and all that. If I had to guess, it's probably about a quarter. When? Exam one, op or exam two opens on the ninth of October. All right, did everybody get the roll? Who didn't get the roll? If you didn't get the roll, come up and sign it, please.